In slightly more than a decade, cryptocurrency went from nothing to, well, something, but what is not easily explained. However, what is clear is that the virtual or digital money has developed an allure that draws people in in ways that even they have trouble explaining. Journalist and author Ethan Liu is among them. His new book chronicles his deep dive into that world. It's called Once a Bitcoin Miner, Scandal and Turmoil in the Cryptocurrency Wild West. And it brings Ethan Liu back to our virtual studio tonight from the downtown core of Ontario's capital city. Ethan, it's great to see you again. I enjoyed the book so much. How are you doing? I am well. Thank you for having me again, Steve. Not at all. I, um, I'm going to start from the premise that there are very few people watching us right now who can really truly explain and or understand what, for example, cryptocurrency or Bitcoin is. So we're going to throw this little explainer up and then we'll come back and chat after that. Okay, Sheldon, if you would. In 2009, Bitcoin, the first cryptocurrency, was born. Bitcoin is digital, meaning there's no physical coin you can touch or hold. But it is different from the digital money you spend shopping online. Bitcoin is what is known as a decentralized digital currency. That means there are no banks, government, or other intermediaries overseeing these transactions. Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies run on blockchain technology. Think of blockchain as a database. Information is stored in blocks. This includes things like transfers and purchases. Once a block is full, it is linked to the previous block, creating a chain. All the blocks are connected chronologically, creating a chain that started in 2009 and continues to this day. So why does Bitcoin have value? The simple answer is people give it that value. They trust it. Currency can take many forms, but the properties of what is known as sound money are universal. Divisibility, durability, recognizability, portability, and scarcity. When we talk about the divisibility of fiat currency like Canadian dollars, we know that one dollar can be broken into 100 cents. In comparison, a Satoshi is the smallest unit of a Bitcoin, equivalent to 100 millionth of a Bitcoin. Unlike Canadian dollars which are printed through the Bank of Canada, there is a limit on how many Bitcoins are available in the market only 21 million Bitcoins will ever be produced. Now, there are two popular ways of acquiring Bitcoin. You can purchase them online or at one of the 11,000 Bitcoin ATMs across Canada. Or you can do what is known as mining. No, you won't be needing a helmet and chisel for this type of excavating, but rather a powerful computer. The concept of mining isn't all that different from mining gold. As you help process transactions on the blockchain, you are rewarded with coins. One of the biggest advantages of cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin is that you can send large sums of money halfway across the world in a matter of 10 minutes. But what can you buy with it? While still limited, you can buy fast food, a hot cup of coffee, plane tickets to your next vacation, tickets to concerts and sporting events. More recently, Tesla announced it would start accepting Bitcoin as a payment method for its products after buying $1.5 billion US in Bitcoin. Okay, thanks to Jane Jagannathan for that explainer, and let's get to it. What got you, Ethan Liu, interested in Bitcoin to begin with? It's a very long story, and it began in uh, 2012, 2013, and that was when I first heard of Bitcoin. It was actually when my friends and I, we were just on the dark web for, I guess, no good reason, and that was my first time just fiddling about on the dark web, and I saw that uh, those dark web marketplaces, and this was this was back when Silk Road, the most infamous of them, was still running, and I saw that they were transacting with Bitcoin. That was the only medium of transaction allowed there, and from there, it did take me like a whole year to, to actually sink my money into Bitcoin, but that was the beginning. And what made it attractive for you? Hmm. Uh, well, at first, I, I could see that why people were using it on the dark web. Uh, it's because there's no central administrator to this. So how Bitcoin works is that it's entirely peer-to-peer. -peer. So those funds, theoretically, they can't be frozen, they can't be seized. And there is a, there is a certain attractiveness to that. And and if you think beyond the dark web, there are lots of uh, other applications for that. And you can see that not only does it have value, other people are going to see that it has value. And of course, at the time, I didn't feel that to a 10, probably like a three or a four. And it was a gradual process. Okay, it can't be frozen or seized, but it can be hacked or stolen. Didn't that disturb you at all? 
Yeah, so I think the the issue, and I think uh, something that is that could possibly be cleared up is that lots of times when people lose Bitcoin uh, or other cryptos due to hacks, it wasn't Bitcoin or other cryptos themselves that are hacked. It's uh, usually something else that is hacked. So, for example, uh, the recent case of the the kid in Hamilton who. Uh, allegedly stole 46 million dollars worth of crypto uh, he didn't he didn't hack the crypto he uh, he did a sim swap so he pretended uh, allegedly to, uh, to be someone else to the telco company and uh, thus uh, essentially stealing their identity and from there that's how uh, people uh, steal steal crypto and ultimately the Biggest feature of Bitcoin is also its biggest bug, that transactions are irreversible. So once stolen, it's gone. Well, that's what made me wonder about what a smart guy like you, who who had a full-time job as a journalist and who's, you know, you've got a book under your belt, you're an author. What are you doing messing around on the dark web, looking for LSD, hanging out with some of these very shady characters? I mean, Ethan, come on. You're such a nice young man. What are you doing? <laughs> well, I... Uh... I was a young man at the time. It was uh, just after my second year of university, so uh, I only finished university in like 2015. So, and uh, why do young men do what they do? It's the same reason that uh, people uh, climb tall piles of rock or ride raging farm animals just to see how long they can stay atop. Okay, I think that actually makes some sense. Now, you had a job, as I suggest, at the Reuters news agency. You're full-time journalist there, and then you quit. And I want to read an excerpt from the book here, which tells the story after that. You write, then almost instantly I wanted more. And there was indeed more. Cryptocurrency had only been around since 2009. Everything was still in its infancy. Like everyone else I'd met, I had been seduced by this new world and its potential and opportunities. Later, when searching for a simple explanation for what I did next, I would cite this, that in that moment, when I came to truly understand my wealth, my heart had been filled and pierced with bewitchment and with desire for the enchanted gold beyond price and count. All right, let's get into this. How does mining cryptocurrency lead to the kind of wealth or financial comfort that apparently gave you enough comfort to quit a real full-time job? Mm -hmm. uh, well, so first of all, I would say uh, when I quit that job, I, I wouldn't... Uh, put it like how uh, someone strikes a lottery and then spends their time sailing all the time. I would uh, liken it more to, say, a lawyer quitting uh, a corporate job where he does mergers and acquisitions and then uh, goes on to uh, start his own firm and doing uh, cases that are more meaningful to him. So, uh, you know, I still have a, I have a column in the Financial Post. I write in the Globe and the Star from time to time. So I have not left uh, my the actual career. It was just more of a changing of the employer. And mining didn't actually make me that much money. It was uh, it was that investment back in 2013. So when I first got into Bitcoin, that was, uh, I, I bought it when it was as low as 1,000 and as low as 200. So 2017, it went up to 20,000. And um, I don't have all of that money right now, but uh, at the time, I did have a lot. Yeah, you were a millionaire at one point, were you not? Yeah, that is correct, and that is, uh, that is a pretty wild thing, eh? <laughs> That's How old were you when you were a millionaire? 27. I, I just turned 27, and I was just two years out of university. That's not too bad, but at a certain point, you did get, what did you get, bored of mining cryptocurrency, or how would you describe what overcame you? Hmm. Uh, well, and I, I think lots of things, uh, they are never just one thing, a uh, multitude of factors. And one of the reasons I, I started mining was also as a, as a vehicle for this book. And I had been thinking of writing this book for a long time, I think ever since 2014. And, you know, one of the things you have to put in a book proposal is, why are you the person to write this book? And for the longest time, I could not answer that question. And uh, mining was... Uh, was a way to, uh, to answer that question. And as I focus more on the book, I sort of wrap that up. Do you have a better answer for the question now? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, and I think ultimately, uh, I think uh, what people search for when they go into this world of cryptocurrency, it's also what people search for when they uh, lust after the Wild West back in those days. Uh, they're searching for freedom and adventure. And 
back then, I, I want to say back then I was very young. I'm still very young now. And I think me, people like me, uh, I think we are searching for those things. Well, you pointed out you do write for some other publications still, and you did write in the Globe and Mail that Bitcoin evokes that long-standing phenomenon we know as the frontier myth. How does it do that? Uh, well, uh, I think I'm not the first person to make that comparison. I think lots of people have compared Bitcoin and cryptocurrency, this world, to the Wild West. But where our conclusions differ is that I don't consider the comparison to be an insult. I think uh, while the actual Wild West is full of injustice, colonialism, and brutality, the idea of the West, uh, what, uh, what beckons people there, that is very positive. Uh, why do people go to the West in the past? Because it offers freedom and it op offers opportunity and riches. But more important than that, in the Wild West, you are free from the societal hierarchies back home. You know, how things are structured in normal society it may not matter that much in the West. And I think the world of crypto is very much like that. And people seeking it what people sought in the West back then. So there is, in your view, a, a kind of a typical crypto personality that might be particularly attracted to that world. Is that fair to say? Oh, yeah, uh, absolutely. And but I think the world is diverse and we all have a lot of differences. But I think uh, the underneath all that, uh, everyone in it has, does have something very similar because uh, when I went to North Korea for that crypto conference, uh, right before then, I met a whole bunch of the other attendees. We had nothing in common, but uh, the first thing a guy said to me was, why did you decide to do this outlandish thing of going to North Korea? And uh, my only response was, well, what about you? And we all just laughed and we never really addressed that, but I think we knew we shared something in an unspoken way. Well, as a matter of fact, that is question eight on my list here. Why in heaven's name would you go to North Korea? You sort of answered it right now, but, um, well, let's put it this way. Admittedly, you're a bit of a, a child of the world, right? You're born in China, but you grew up in West Germany, and now here you are in North Korea. Did it, did it at any point occur to you that that might not be the smartest thing in the world to do? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so firstly, uh, why I decided to go to North Korea, other than the crypto aspect, uh, because uh, North Korea was holding a cryptocurrency conference, it was also that um, I think of North Korea as a time capsule, because when I always tell my parents of how weird North Korea is, they would say, it's not weird, this is the China in which I grew up. But over the years, China has changed a lot, and North Korea has remained rather stagnant. So I've always thought that if I can go to North Korea, I can sort of see how my parents grew up. And I've long wanted to go to North Korea. And when the crypto conference came, that was, uh, that I, I was like, I have to go. And, and also, I should say that uh, North Korea, it's before the pandemic, at least, it has opened it, itself to tourism. Lots of people uh, go there all the time. And so while it may not seem like a normal thing to do, it's not, in my view, at least completely outlandish. Well, it may be that more people are going there, but if I read your book uh, correctly, there's a lot more people who are trying to get out of there right now. Uh, how, as you look back on the experience now, um, would you advise other people to go to North Korea? Mm. Well, I would say, um, I guess probably yes. It, I think it depends on your, your personal risk tolerance and... I, I actually don't see why not, um, but probably not in the pandemic because they've they've suspended these tours. But uh, if they if they ever come back again, these are legitimate tourism companies, and they, they take you there. And generally, I, I I would think of it as quite safe. Well, let me ask you about a high profile figure in the cryptocurrency world, a man by the name of Virgil Griffith, who was on the same trip as you. What happened to him? Mm -hmm. Well, he uh, he got arrested. So uh, maybe to uh, to uh, address that previous question again, if you're American, it'll probably be a good idea not to go to North Korea because uh, he he was he had the ill fate of being born an American, and Americans they can't go to North Korea after someone went there, got detained, and, and later died. So uh, he he not only so, oh he wasn't allowed to go, he sought permission to go, he was denied, and so. They were clearly watching him from the beginning. And then he gave a speech there. And he's accused of uh, imparting technical advice to North Korea. 
uh, with respect to crypto and uh, with respect to uh, evading sanctions, and he pleaded guilty in uh, September of this year. Let me raise another guy who is a, a big player in your book, and his name is Jan Serato, uh, with whom you, you actually uh, publish in the back of your book uh, a lengthy email exchange that the two of you had. Uh, you seem quite balanced during the course of it. He seemed quite, well, I'm not sure what word to use, but d d distracted, I guess, is, a, is a, a gentle way of describing the way that his emails uh, seem to you. Uh, okay, talk to me about your relationship with him and, and um, how it ended up. Mm -hmm. So uh, it, it was actually a, a text exchange. But yeah, my relationship with him, I, I first came across him when uh, I, I went to this crypto meetup in Calgary and it was branded as a workshop. But when I walked in, uh, they were people clearly selling a scam. There was this guy, he literally quoted the Bible. He said, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not to your own understanding. And that project was eventually sued by the uh, SEC in the US. And I should say Jan Serato's side of the story that he would later say he had nothing at all to do with the event, but he was listed as the organizer of the event. So that was when I first came across him and he would be involved in a case in the book which is now before the Alberta Securities Commission. And again, his side of the story is that in that case, he had only uh, a minimal role and he was uh, he was just the marketing guy and not the ringleader. But uh, from, the, from what sources tell me and from what I write in the book, uh, the records that I have seen and what the ASC is accusing him of, he ran this uh, illegal investing club and people basically gave them their money and uh, he would, uh, or the club would invest it uh, on their behalf in various cryptocurrencies. It was called the Whale Club. And ultimately it was a case of the blind leading the blind. And lots of people lost lots of money. Are you one of them? Uh, no, I, I, I think from the beginning, I, did not think of that as something I would put my money into, that it was indeed a, a little suspicious. But 2017, let me tell you, that was a, that was a wild time. That was, uh, Bitcoin went from 1,000 to 20,000. All sorts of projects were entering and all sorts of people were claiming all sorts of expertise. And the interesting thing is that you didn't need to know what you were doing to make money because everyone's a genius in the bull market. <laughs> but uh, when the crypto winter comes, uh, yeah, the it came for everyone. In our last couple of minutes here, I guess one of the things that helped me understand cryptocurrency was the notion that, that you know, air miles is a kind of a currency. Aeroplan points are a kind of a currency. You know, you collect them and you spend them. And, and cryptocurrency, Bitcoin, I guess, is the same kind of thing. Uh, my question for you is, now that you've looked into this so much and spent so much time on it, do you think that cryptocurrency is going to become, as air miles and aeroplan points have, do you think it's going to become more mainstream and everyday people are going to be into this in a big way? Uh, yeah, absolutely. And I think uh, yeah, you can definitely draw the comparison between Bitcoin and air miles, but there is a big difference there in that air miles, it, uh, whether you have it, how you spend it, it depends on the benevolence of the, the company controlling it. And I would... Uh, I would tell you the story about Bitcoin that uh, I love telling. It illustrates, I think, in the best way its uh, use case. So in Afghanistan, uh, back when the Taliban were taking over and when refugees tried to flee, and they all, most of them, uh, they can't leave with their, with their money. They leave often penniless because of how bad their financial infrastructure is and how bad their currency is. But there was this young lady I've heard who had Bitcoin and... She, it was a harrowing journey for her out of Afghanistan. She had to cross Iran and Turkey and her ship sank in the Mediterranean. But when she landed in Germany, she effectively, uh, when you memorize your passphrase, you effectively just carry Bitcoins in your head. And so she was able to use two Bitcoins to fund a new life in Germany. And I think at the end of the day, uh, our financial infrastructure uh, we take a lot of these things for granted, but we forget how 
how fragile they are and how quickly they can fade away. But Bitcoin at its heart, it's, a, it's an anti-fragile version of that. Hmm. Well, it is a fascinating and dramatic story, and it's well told in Once a Bitcoin Miner, Scandal and Turmoil in the Cryptocurrency Wild West, and it's brought Ethan Liu to our virtual studio tonight from downtown Toronto in uh, Ontario's capital city. And Ethan, it's been good to see you again. Stay well, okay? Always a pleasure. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism.